Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. That kid is back on the escalator again. Ain't gonna hurt. Is my boomstick. Game over, man. Game over. Welcome to the Bargain Bit. He is your host, Ben Mason. And he is your co-host, Sandra Luketic. And today we're talking 1995's In the Mouth of Madness. We assume if you're listening to this episode, you've already seen the movie. All right, buddy. Here we are again with another John Carpenter film. One I'm almost 100% positive you haven't seen. But um, did you know anything about it going into it? <laughs> uh, so prior to you saying that, I was going to chime in and say, prior to this, I think the only thing I knew about this movie was I was familiar that the name In the Mouth of Madness was a movie title. <laughs> that's it. Perfect. <laughs> so that's it. You had no idea who that's... was in it, what it was about. Didn't know that it was John Carpenter. Didn't know who was in it. I knew that I I heard you say we're doing In the Mouth of Madness. And I was like, huh, I've heard that name before. That's what I knew about it. <laughs> it, uh, it, it really draws heavily off of uh, Stephen King mythos, uh, uh, H.P. Lovecraft mythos. And the title alone is very similar to uh, At the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft. So uh, I kind of assumed you would have done a little bit of research and saw what you would be getting yourself into before you watched it. Was that uh, was that the case, or you just go in blind? Uh, I go in blind. I usually now I will I will full transparency. I had a crazy week and I didn't do research beyond watching the movie. Uh, mm-hmm. Which I don't do every time. I try to do. But even when I do, I do it after my first viewing so that I don't spoil or ruin or even just kind of uncover any of the mystique of the movie before I see it. I want that first viewing to just be completely fresh, completely uninfluenced, and just like watching the movie and just kind of letting myself get absorbed in it. Then, if I do research, which I didn't do this time... I would do that after between my two viewings. All right. Yeah, well, I mean, really, the research is, by definition, trivial. Uh, it's just a, it's a Toronto film. Um, and a lot of the, the mythos of one of the characters, the author in the, in the film, is uh, some of his lines of text are taken directly from Lovecraft's work and uh, the history of Stephen King. So as a, as a horror fan, it's a pretty favored movie in my collection um but i i do have to apologize because i wasn't thinking when i selected this movie for this episode because a lot of it is very visual so my notes are going to be it's going to be a lot of me talking and hopefully you reacting but we'll uh, we'll see how it goes i think that's more an apology for our audience than it is for me <laughs> oh yeah yeah no i did not mean to apologize to you screw you oh, oh okay well in that yeah. case just keep reinforcing the fact that I'm the nice one on this podcast. Um, <sighs> because really, for me, it didn't change it. I watched the movie. Whether that note, note-taking note is more visual or not, I just watched the movie. Yeah. It is our audience that will have to kind of sift through that. So might and as well. I, I highly recommend everybody watch this movie. Um, I, I did my best to uh, bring you all along with, uh, with us for this ride, but... Uh, I, there's no way I'm going to be able to capture everything that Carpenter put on screen here, and I, I highly recommend checking it out. All right. Well, let's do it. All right. Well, we open to an oddly heavy John Carpenter theme uh, played over a printing press in action. What is it printing? It's the new horror novel by author Sutter Kane. We then cut to the water treatment plant in Toronto, which in this film is the local asylum. And it's uh, it's always a location I wanted to visit when I lived in Toronto. Um it's an iconic location for me. Um, something about it just stands out. It doesn't look real. And it definitely doesn't look like a water treatment plant. But it is what it is. Um, you got a ambulance... few places in Toronto that you've been meaning to visit. You never did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what two, of the most, two of the most depressing things in the country. A grave and a water treatment plant. What were you doing in Toronto all that time? <laughs> <laughs> And then I was with the institution's newest patient, John Trent, played by the amazing Sam Neill. Who doesn't love Sam Neill? Uh, I, uh, I don't know. It's safe to say you're a fan, right? You like Jurassic Park. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like Sam. I don't know if I'd say I'm a Sam Neill fan. Uh, probably just because of a lack of familiarity beyond this. Mm-hmm. I know that he was in Jurassic Park, and that I don't know if that's enough to say I'm a fan. But I definitely enjoyed his previous work that I saw him in. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I always thought he was, like, Australian. But apparently Irish-born and raised in New Zealand. So, fuck that one up. <laughs> uh, the attendees seem to be awaiting the arrival in a strange anticipation. Obviously, John Trent has a sense of clout about him. He's dragged into the main hall, clothed in jeans and your stereotypical straitjacket. And Saperstein, the man in charge, played by John Glover, instructs the attendees to put Trent in room nine. Trent immediately becomes aggressive, fighting off anybody who touches him, even kicking one of the orderlies in the balls. They eventually subdue him and drag him into his new home. Once inside, Trent begs for forgiveness, apologizing for the groin shot, saying it was just a lucky shot. And at this point, what are you thinking about this character of John Trent? I mean, what can you think? I, I was completely hooked the first time I saw it. He Carpenter, uh, he threw us right into the middle of a crazy situation. And I think the clamoring to make sense of it really sets the tone for the movie. Uh, not in a, a negative way, but like I, I was curious from the get-go. I, I was definitely intrigued. Obviously, when you start with something like a, you know, a main character being admitted into a, like a mental asylum, you want to know what the heck is going on. Like, why? But... Based on, like, you know, short reaction time, flip-flopping between being apologetic and aggressive, it's hard to really determine what is this character at this point, right? So, you know, you ask me, what did I think of this character? I thought, I don't know what is going on with this character, and I want to find out. Yeah, and the character, they give him, like, a very serious introduction, and then, like, a jokingly sly apology about kicking a guy in the groin. But the whole scene is very tense, and then Carpenter flips it again with a joke uh, in that um, uh, Trent yells from his cell, I'm not insane, you hear me? I'm not insane. And then from down the hall, you hear another voice yell, I'm not if he's not. (laughs) And then further down, another one's like, me neither. Uh, As the, the camera pans down the hall, revealing other inmates in their cells. So I'm completely confused at this point. I know I'm enjoying it, but I don't know what I was in for the first time I saw this. I actually didn't recognize uh, John Glover immediately. It, it took me a minute. Yeah, um, I, I guess most people really know him from uh, Smallville. That's what I like. That's the first time I remember like putting a name with a face and like really seeing the work. I then later saw, oh, you know, he has done some small roles that I I was familiar with, but it was Smallville that really made me familiar with him and 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 i very much liked his performance but he had like the long hair the facial hair it looked very different so this yeah i mean almost felt like a caricature almost like it really did even it was the, like over animated and everything i i like it though like even, I, yeah i was, I was gonna old. say even the mannerisms of the character were kind of like a little over the top a little cartoonish so uh, it took me a while to realize, like, that's John Glover. And then by the end of the movie, I was like, man, I wish I saw more of him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like the talent was wasted. I mean, the character was used really well, but I would have loved to have seen him on screen more. I would have loved to see him doing a dual role. Oh, that would have been cool. Mm-hmm. He definitely has the talent to do that. Uh, he definitely does. And I feel like he easily could have played um, Oliver. If I got that name right. Oliver. Maybe I got the name wrong. Um, it is the man in the bar. I, I don't want to say... Oh, Simon. Simon. There we go. I think he could have done yeah. a great job playing Simon. Um, yeah, that would have been great. would have given him more camera time. It would have been uh, an opportunity for him to flex his uh, you know, acting chops by doing a dual role. And if playing that Simon, obviously, the like a very counter, like opposite character to uh saperstein because he's so serious um but you know it is what it is right that's a great idea and the actor that played simon doesn't really fit in the movie so seeing glover do that role would have been awesome yeah Yeah. good call man yeah um well glover decides to uh, calm down the residents by piping in music by the carpenters wink wink (laughs) uh over the institution speakers the inmates begin to sing along much to trent's chagrin 
He falls against a padded wall of his new home and slumps to the floor. The music drags to a halt as if the cassette player's battery slowly died, and then silence. The lights flicker. Trent nervously looks around his cell. A hand appears in the window of his door and lightly knocks. He slowly rises and peers out to view his unexpected visitor, but sees nothing. Behind him, we see a dark silhouette. Trent spins around and angrily yells, This is a horrible way to end it. An echoed voice replies, This isn't the end. You haven't read it yet. Cut to flashes of a church, blood, laughter, monsters, axes, and a hand smashing through the window of Trent's door. He cries out and falls, face planting on the dirty mattress that lies upon the cold floor. Turns to look at the door. No broken glass. No intruder. Nothing. What just happened? Then we get the introduction of Dr. Wren, played by David Warner, who's arrived at the institution expecting to question Trent. Saperstein asks Wren as to how he got there so quickly, and the response is that they've been monitoring emergency lines and this man seems to fit the symptoms. Saperstein asks if Trent is, quote, one of them, and then states that things must be getting pretty bad out there to bring someone like Wren in. Wicked build for this story. I, I have to know at this point what's going on. Um, in retrospect, it, I'm not a fan of it. What? Yeah, Why I not? Honest, I think that it would have been more impactful if we just got into the story and had the slow build of him investigating. With the entire asylum scene, it definitely throws you into like a fit of confusion. And I mean, that might be the very attempt to create the intrigue. But I also feel like it opened... I mean, maybe it's a bias. You know me. I don't like the whole starting with something to dive into a flashback. Um, yeah, but we haven't hit that point yet. I thought it was amazing because I felt uneasy with the introduction of Trent's character and then bringing in this bigwig doctor and then knowing that shit's going crazy outside and not knowing exactly what's happening. I thought it was a wicked build in a very short amount of time. I, yeah, it was done very well in and in and of itself, but I would have liked it better if the movie from a flow standpoint continued from that point on rather than then going back and then having us you know live out like an hour plus of how he got to this point Um, if it went from this point on the movie would be over in five minutes well you don't know that when you're watching it (laughs) it's just an opinion all right like i'm saying it was recorded well it was done very well i just don't like the whole building this intrigue and then bouncing back that's it that's all i'm saying man (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you're one of those people. Well, I'm sorry. There, there's, I have a, a there's a certain shut up. There's a certain type of sorry. I'm uh, a nice one. <laughs> <laughs> there is a certain type of person that really does not like the three days earlier like title screen or text screen that like there's a setup that's actually like the resolution of a story and then you have to go back in time to figure out how you got there. I understand that a lot of people don't like that, and it it doesn't always work. But when it works, it works really well, and I think this is one of those scenarios i i mean that's why that's why i did prefix it by saying like this is a bias that i have that i know i have and i'm just curious to know how the movie would play out if you shuffled it around i don't know if it would be as impactful yeah i mean i feel like you could even do uh like instead of starting with this do this part like 15 minutes in and find out that He's already in the asylum and talking to the doctor. You just kind of cut out the admission part. And that way Mm -hmm. you start with the same build. But again, this is just nitpicking. Uh, Like I said, in and of itself, the scenes are recorded well and done well. I just, I didn't, I don't like the three days earlier type thing. Okay. I get that. Saperstein lets the doctor into Trent's cell and we see that with Trent's request of a single black crayon, he has drawn crosses all over the walls, all over his clothes, and all over his arms and face. Uh, I don't know how you draw over your arms and face with crayon, but he did it somehow. See, I liked the the visuals of this. Oh yeah, it looked great. It just didn't make sense. Going back, even after watching the movie and knowing how things pan out, him drawing all the crosses makes no sense. Makes no sense. Plus, there's no way you're getting all that out of one crayon. Well, yes, but I mean, (laughs) where does he eventually (laughs) find um, uh, 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 Sutter Kane when he finds him? Yeah, but even then, all the crosses are upside down. It's true. It's true. I don't know. It's just a little weird. Yeah. (laughs) I actually think... No, I'm with you. 
I think it would have been better if instead of a whole bunch of crosses, it was um, passages from what would have been the novel that he read, right? Uh, we wouldn't know that at the time. But if it was just random sentences, and obviously that would have been a lot more work to, to have somebody try and think up what they would all say and stuff like that. But if it was meant to be, you know, excerpts from the book, that would have made more sense to me from the insanity standpoint. Oh, I disagree completely because he's trying to stay safe in there. So writing passages from the one thing that's fucking up everything would be contradictory. I, I'm i just talking about a visual standpoint, but okay. I'll, I'll stop All right. sharing yeah, my no, opinion. No, that's fine. No, no. Nah. All right. Ren tells Trent that he's there to get him out. He then comments on the crosses saying that they would have to keep him there if anyone saw them. Uh, and that's where I was saying it's a slight nod to him wanting to be kept inside. Uh he asks the doctor if it, if what he sorry if he wants to hear about his them. He then reiterates that every paranoid schizophrenic has a them, a they, and it, and Ren is going to learn about his. Trent then asks, things are going to shit out there, aren't they? And then we launch into our story. John Trent was an insurance investigator, and everything began with the disappearance of author Sutter Kane. This is where we get your disapproved jump back in time. Trent and his associate Robinson are having a meeting with a man they're investigating. They prove that the man's indeed committing insurance fraud, having burned down his own business. They have photos of the man's wife and mistress wearing expensive clothing that he claims were destroyed in the fire. Later, at a diner, Trent and Robbie, as he calls him, are having lunch. Robbie asks Trent about the Sutter Kane case. The acclaimed horror author has gone missing. Across the street, a man storms out of a store with an axe. He beelines across the street, smashing through the diner window and demanding to know if Trent reads Sutter Kane. The confused investigator sees the maniac's pupils and irises are splitting, almost doubling, and the armed man swings the blade towards Trent's face. Gunfire erupts in the eatery as two beat cops bring down the crazed individual. At home, John is enjoying some much-needed whiskey and watching the evening news. Riots broke out at bookstores earlier that day as publishers couldn't supply the demand of the new Sutter Kane novel In the Mouth of Madness. Now, this is where I think watching the movie a second time is pretty important because as the story progresses, we know that this book has not yet actually been released in Trent's uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, it I it honestly... makes sense that the, the guy who breaks into the cafe, diner, whatever you want to call it, is yep. Sutter Kane's, I think they said, agent? It's his agent, yeah. Right? Which would make sense because the book hasn't released, but who might have already read it? His agent, right? Um, obviously, I didn't put that together, you know, at this point. But in retrospect, it is a, it is a, it is well written. It is a good, yeah, yeah. No, but but like the the riots at the stores are because they ran out of the book. But to Trent, that book hasn't been published yet. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> the next day, Trent's in the lobby of Arcane Publishing, uh, staring at Lovecraftian artwork that adorns the covers of Kane's work. There he meets publishing director Jackson Harglow, played by Carlton Heston, I think one of his last roles, uh, and Kane's editor, Linda Stiles, played by Julie Carmen. Linda boasts about Kane's credibility, stating that you can forget about Stephen King. You fun note that this is obviously inspired by King, like I said before, and his influence on the genre. Uh, is Kane that line meant to be almost like a, like a tongue-in-cheek nod to him? Like, oh yeah, King it, and Carpenter are friends. So it, it's yeah, it, it it almost feels like we're not insulting him. It's almost like one of those good gestured like ribs that you would give to your friend. Oh yeah. Also, look at the names: Stephen King, Sutter Kane. Yeah, 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 yeah. One hundred percent. But I, I just mean like it didn't. It didn't feel like it came from a malicious place. It almost felt no, like the it was kind of thing. Definitely jovial. Yeah, that you would like kind of nudge your buddy in the rib and be like, eh, watch this part. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you had Stephen King as Sutter Kane, this movie would suck. <laughs> Why is that? He's such a, a terrible actor with a whiny voice. All right, well. <laughs> uh, actually, I kind of want to see it now. Anyway, sorry. Um, Kane disappeared months ago and nobody has any idea where he is. The last person to hear from him was his agent, who was sent a copy of the new manuscript with no accompanying details. The agent? Again, like you said, it was the man who attacked Trent at the diner. John believes that this is nothing more than a publicity stunt. 
Linda says that Kane's work has a weird effect on the reader. And out of nowhere, Trent starts hitting on her. She shoots him down, but they keep chatting. It's really awkward and uncomfortable. This and did not feel natural at all. No, it felt like bad acting. It was f- so forced. Yeah. But which is, it, it's very strange because Sam Neill is a great actor, but he just, this felt wrong. Something was way off. I, I don't think it was him. I think this was actually a case of, you know, bad writing after I just said something about good writing. Um, <laughs> because it, no, it really is like they have this flip flop of the character who's being clearly not infatuated with this woman it's it's almost more confrontational and then it's almost like just completely like 180 just oh hey you wanna you wanna go out like i don't know it didn't seem to have any sort of natural con- conversational flow no it is also kind of mirrored later in the movie but even then that scene just feels out of place mm-hmm uh, Kane's work has become uh, erratic. Sorry, 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 sorry. I, I just want to say one more thing before you move on. Yeah. Um, and this is a going thing for the entire movie. I don't like the chemistry between the two of them. No. That's all. I don't think anybody does. Yeah. It's not done well. But the thing is, I can't figure out if it's supposed to feel like it's done well. No. Yeah. No, I think it's uh, uh, spoiler for awards. I think it might be some bad casting. Okay. Uh, Kane's work had become erratic, and he convinced himself that what he was writing was actually real, and eventually cut off all contact. The company and the world need to know what's happening. John stands on everything. We fucked up the air, the water. We fucked up each other. Why not finish it off by just flushing our brains down the toilet? Linda challenges Trent to read some of the books to see if he can actually grasp the concepts and equips, got any on tape? (laughs) (laughs) Walking home that night, Trent sees a few Sutter Kane posters lacquered to a brick wall. He looks at a tattered piece of one before a commotion in the alley draws his attention. A police officer is beating a man who is spray painting a wall, the letters I-C-A still dripping with wet paint. The cop turns and asks Trent if he wants some too. At home, Trent is on the phone saying that he he knows this whole thing is one big scam, a pop phenomenon that had, the company was capitalizing on. The next day, he goes to a local bookstore. The retailer is a mess after having been ravaged by Kane's fans. Trent picks out different books by the author, and an employee says to John, I can see. He sees you. The response? Uh, tell him I say hi. Isn't He's really good at these one-liners. He is, and... It's so weird. What? Just, just, like, the whole situation. It's just weird. It is really weird. But I like Trent's reaction. It's kind of like, uh, everything's fine. Pretend this is normal. Uh, tell him I say hi. I'm going to be on my way now. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool yet uneasy at the same time. Where are you in the movie at this point? Are you are you hooked? Are you are you in for this ride, or are you like, all right, let's get the story going? Um, I think the only place you can be uh, at this point is curious. Uh, yeah, it keeps building curiosity. Like they 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 know how to bait you in and give you just enough to make you wonder, but it's not like a lot of movies where at this point you can already start thinking, well, maybe this and. You can't devise a theory at this point. They they haven't given you anything like to kind of put together right now mm-hmm. yet other than just I need more. Right? I need more I information. Think, yeah. I think this is a, a mixture of uh or a combo of both good writing and good directing because there are so many questions asked in such a short amount of time that anybody else I think it would it would almost come across as overwhelming. But here it's just building the mystery like bigger and bigger. <laughs> while keeping you focused on wanting these answers and like everything straight line, like you know exactly what's going on, but you're just getting more and more invested in the story. During a phone call with Robbie, Trent says that he's been reading some of Kane's books. They're all the same, slimy things in the dark, people go mad, they turn into monsters, but the writing is much better than he was expecting. The more Trent reads, the more invested he gets. 
back to John, inspecting the poster on the wall. The same commotion draws him to an alley. Only this time there are more letters spray-painted on the wall. I can see. The cop beats the vandal and turns to reveal a monstrous face, and John snaps out of it. Did he fall asleep reading, or was he hallucinating? He returns to the book, and we delve back into the scene of the police beating. As Trent watches the brutality, he's surrounded by others, one of which being Kane's agent, axe in hand. The man tells Trent, Kane sees him, and then the mob attack, hacking at Trent. He wakes up from the nightmare in a horrible sweat, only for a jump scare as the monstrous officer is sitting next to him on the couch. He jolts awake for real this time, throwing the novel across the room. Continuing his studies, Trent reads on and makes notes. So involved with his duties, he doesn't realize his pen is leaking and he smears black ink under his eyes. Engulfed by the mystery of the disappearance, he disregards the ink and ponders where exactly Kane could have gone. Looking at his coffee table littered with Kane's books, Trent sees something. He grabs a pair of scissors and starts cutting the book's covers. Following red lines on each cover, he cuts pieces that end up fitting together and forming the shape of the state of New Hampshire, with a red dot on one piece revealing where Kane's location is, Hobbs End. The I really here like this. Is that that town doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to That's jump awesome. in too early there. Uh, I really liked how the like the pieces of the covers made a map. That was that was well done. It was very well done. I, I'm 100% into this movie at this point. I, I think it's impossible not to be unless you just don't like film. At the insistence of Harglow, Trent and Linda set out for Hobbs End. During the journey, they get lost. Linda's sleeping, and John wakes her with a toy horn that he keeps in the glove compartment, uh, which I found strange. Uh, she repeatedly hits him with a bag of chips, and I'm not sure why exactly we're getting this weird bit of awkward humor. Um, I think it really is the chemistry between the actors here. Uh, I think this could be like... It could be amusing if it were a lighter film and like Sam Neill is way too dramatic well, for it, Julie Carmen. I don't I don't even think it's that Sam Neill is way too dramatic. I think that John Trent is also way too um pessimistic and he is skeptical very cynical. to then turn yeah. around and be playful. Like it just like nothing of what we've gotten from the character, which I don't necessarily believe is Sam Neill's fault at this point in the movie, um, is it would imply that he knows how to have fun. <laughs> like up until now, he's been so like f this, f that. We've ruined the world. Like you know what I mean? It just it doesn't yeah. seem to fit the character that we've been given thus far. Well, the character itself doesn't really fit the film, and I think that's intentional. Um, because this this movie is firmly placed in the mid '90s, but the character of John Trent is very much like a a noir character from the '40s. Like this character is a detective from a film noir. Like that's exactly where he's pulled out of, and it just doesn't really jive with pop culture. Um, so yeah, I think what you're saying is right. Like the character of John Trent isn't that lighthearted or comedy focused. He's uh, cynical. By the books, I'll say no mumbo jumbo kind of individual. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I don't like. I don't know. I don't know if I can blame this on Sam Neill. His acting has been just yeah. fine, but you just get this complete like contradiction to the type of character we've been introduced to thus far. Yeah, and then like the next scene, which I'm going to describe here, really kind of states what the character's all about or his uh, at least his uh his perspective on life because uh later that night while they're still driving the two get into the intricacies of trent's job uh, he flat out states that from his experiences anybody is capable of anything it doesn't leave him much to believe in but it also doesn't leave him anything to be disappointed by so he's very matter of fact but i don't know it's just i like the character but it doesn't really fit in the movie for me and i, I think that was the intent too like they're uh, trying to make him feel like a fish out of water. Exactly. Okay, I can it's, see that. It's smart. I think it's smart. Um, the discussion turns to Sutter Kane's work. Linda's scared by it, but John shrugs it off. None of it's real, he believes. Linda agrees that yes, none of it is real from his point of view. And that of reality's point of view. 
what worries her is what would happen if reality shared Kane's point of view. Um, the scene could carry a lot of weight, but it kind of comes across as a little muddled. And I don't know if that's line delivery or what they're actually discussing. Um, I, I feel like in the context of the scene, it just wasn't the right time for this conversation. I, you know what? I think that's exactly what it is. I feel it, like it's, this conversation... It's a great conversation, but sorry, not... Sorry. Weird. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I apologize. And then I'm sorry for cutting you off when I said sorry. Um, <laughs> what I was going to say is I feel like this conversation would have worked better the first time they returned to the hotel room. Um, but Yeah. Yeah, totally. But it, hey, it is what it is, right? So. She continues, that reality is what we say it is. It's your thing. Uh, sane, yeah, sane and insane could easily switch places if the insane became the majority. And if that was the case, Trent would find himself in a padded cell wondering what happened to the world. Trent states that would never happen to him. I mean, nice little reference there. Um, it's again, not needed. It feels like a fine. conversation that took place at the wrong time for the purpose of exposition dump. And mm. I'm just not a fan of the fit there. I, I feel like it was just kind of, they were shoving the square hole into the circle peg. It, it just wasn't the right time for it. Yeah, agreed. The drive goes further into the night. Trent needs to sleep, so Linda takes the wheel. During her shift, she passes a boy riding his bicycle down the center of the road. The one and only Darth Vader, Hayden Christensen. <laughs> <laughs> she drives by the boy, illuminated by the red tail lights. He fades into the darkness. Further down the road, Linda again sees the reflectors on the pedals of the boy's bike, this time heading toward the car. As the headlights fall upon the cyclist, Linda sees the boy is now an old man, and he simply just rides past the car, ignoring it. Slightly shaken, she puts her glasses to look at a map. Puts on her glasses, I should say. Um, <laughs> as she looks up, the old man is directly in front of the car. The vehicle slams into the bicycle and sends the man flying over its roof car screeches to a halt. Linda and John run to the crumpled body laying on the road. The old man keeps repeating, I can't get out. He won't let me out. Which is unnerving in and of itself, but only made worse in that it's spoken in the voice of a young boy. Linda looks away for one second, and when she turns back, the old man is upright. He gets on his bike and rides off into the dark. This scene might have been my peak curiosity in the movie. <laughs> really? Mm-hmm. Huh. What uh, what about it strikes you so? I don't know. It almost feels like... <sighs> what was that movie we reviewed? Coherence? Uh, yeah. It almost feels like this scene with the, the cyclist and the changing of the ages and everything felt like that first time walking through the dark area where... Oh at, yeah, where like at, like they were now traveling into a place that didn't exist, and and maybe the fact that I watched Coherence previously on this show mm -hmm. had that more in my mind. But right away, I'm like, all right, things have completely changed now. Um, and yeah, that's a good point because from this point on, it starts getting weird and very very weird. It's a subtle thing, but not just the the changing of the age of the cyclist. The part that really got me, um, and it was more like feeling like these characters were now trapped, was how they showed him coming from different directions as they were driving mm -hmm. the same direction. Um, so it, it made it feel like like they are crossing through like this infinite loop right now. Yes. And there is one, one part of the scene that actually did give me chills and does every time I see it. And it's when Linda looks back and the old man is upright and he's walking his bike at first and he just slowly turns and looks over his shoulder back at her and like the expression on his face is almost hate and disgust and then he just gets on the bike and rides off mm -hmm. it's it's perfect in my opinion uh, it's it's a very good scene very good scene and like i said this is where things get weird he goes back on the road, uh, John's sleeping again, and Linda loses sight of the yellow road lines. Uh, she sticks her head out of the window and looks at the ground. A flash of lightning reveals only clouds below them. She darts her head back into the car just as the wheels hit a series of planks, revealing that they're actually driving through a covered bridge. 
car emerges from the other end and is engulfed by impossible daylight. Linda stops the car. John awakens and is happily surprised that they made it. Linda looks out the window and sees a sign that welcomes them to Hobbs End, the town they both know doesn't exist. Trent's absolutely amazed that Linda found the town. Uh, she insists <laughs> <laughs> She insists he takes over the drive at this point. She's done. He has uh, no faith in her whatsoever. None. Which absolutely is another zero. reason where it's like, why would he hit on her? <laughs> like, yeah, he, yeah, he... Basically wants nothing to do with her, yet he still hits on her and is, like, disturbingly playful. Yep. I, oh. Well, as they get deeper into town, they can't help but notice the lack of uh, townsfolk. No traffic, no pedestrians, nothing. <laughs> Otis. This, this must have been where they filmed Masters of the Universe. <laughs> uh, yeah, right? <laughs> I don't know where this town was. I mean, I'm sure we could find out easily enough, but for the most part, I know it was filmed in Ontario, so I'm kind of curious. Uh, out of nowhere, a dog runs into the street. A dog that is followed by sickly, diseased-looking children. But only Linda sees this. Trent looks and sees absolutely nothing. As they continue on, uh, the audience is treated to the sight of a bloody axe in the background. Which doesn't really make sense. I don't... When you look at the story. You're going to have to tell me if I miss this, but I don't know if that axe ever comes back into play. Uh, No. The only thing no, it, that I it doesn't. The only thing that I got about it was is this some sort of reference to the agent from earlier? Um, and and later, but it could be. But uh, other than that, it's it does not fit in this story. Yeah, it was weird. They pull up to the local hotel or inn, I guess, bed and breakfast, something along those lines. Uh, one that Linda has only read about in Kane's books. She tells the story of hideous visions that townspeople saw in the greenhouse, something massive with arms like snakes. Trent believes it <laughs> believes the hotel to be a perfect tourist attraction. Without looking, Linda tells John about a painting that should be right behind them in the lobby. And it is. Uh, she warns him of a loose board he's about to step on. And he does. Things are a little too convenient, yet Trent refuses to be fooled. Um, this is also a weird scene. I kind of liked it, but it does feel a little awkward. I think I just don't like the character of Linda. I think that might be it. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. There's something that doesn't sit right about her. No. It's just, I think it might be the delivery here because this is, this should be a really cool scene and it just feels clunky. Um, clunky is a good word clunky is a good word for it yeah like it's not bad right like it's just something doesn't work yeah it's it's odd it feels off it's cool but it it could be better uh they're greeted by mrs pickman happy gilmore's grandma francis bay that's what i knew her from (laughs) (laughs) she's been in a lot though a whole lot. Uh, but that's great. what I knew her from, because Happy Gilmore is a movie that I've actually seen a number of times. Yeah, yeah she's great in that, too. She's mm-hmm. just a good actor, really good actor. Well, I don't think but, I'll ever forget the scenes of her in the uh, old folks home in Happy Gilmore. I think that's why no. anytime I see her, I'm going to recognize her. <laughs> well, it's in good regard. High, high esteem, anyway. Yeah. Trent jokes about her little hotel is famous because of Kane's novels, but Pickman knows nothing of what he's speaking. While the two chat, Linda looks at the painting she spoke of previously. It's of a couple looking out at a lake, but when Linda looks closer, the woman in the painting turns her head and stares directly at her. I like this. Yeah, me too. I like everything about that painting every time it's in this movie. I actually, I, I really want the final painting. Like, I would love to have that somehow. What, the one where it's like a blob instead of people? Monsters? Yeah, blobby monsters, whatever. No, very, very Lovecraftian. I love it. All right. Uh, in a hotel room, Trent oh, shrugs off. It what? Make it one of those pictures where, depending on what angle you look at it, you know those ones? Yeah, no, those suck. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> They're so cheap, man. What are you talking about? But yeah, but like if actual you look... like a commissioned painting of the last 
time we see that would be amazing. Well, yeah, if it's a commission painting, but I just meant like if you had like a poster on your wall or something and you could have it where like from one angle, it's the normal, the first image. And then from the yeah. other angle, it's the final image. That'd be pretty I guess trippy. it was good quality and not like that weird vinyl -y stuff. Yeah. Sorry, I'll stop making suggestions. Apparently, I didn't learn earlier in the episode. What are you talking? I am not the bad guy here. You're just shooting down everything I say, Sandra. You just uh, uh, this would be cool to have. Those suck. <laughs> You're right. That was pretty negative. Okay. <laughs> Go back and listen to this one later. <laughs> <laughs> what if, What if I'm just negative, but I'm smiling while I do it? Does that cancel itself out? Well, you're not giving me the like nudge into the ribs <laughs> like uh like i'm stephen king or something so no <laughs> <laughs> oh god my apologies that's all right that's all right let's just keep going <laughs> uh in the hotel room trent shrugs off what styles was saying she saw he states that in kane's book mrs pickman murders her husband and slices him into coleslaw and they both know that kindly old woman downstairs is incapable of that linda's taking this incredibly seriously but Trent is just getting annoyed now. He asks if everything is as the book says, then there will, or he says, sorry, that if everything is as the book says, then there will be an ornate church that can be seen out of a particular window. He pulls back the curtain and reveals there's nothing there. Linda sighs and says, he didn't read closely enough. The view will be out the window pointing to the east. So she pulls back those curtains and the top of the church can be seen peeking above the town's old trees. They go to investigate. I like that. Um, it's great. It was such a wicked reveal. Well, because he, he almost, like, he really wanted to be like, gotcha. And then she's just like, no, it's actually over here. You know, like, it's just, it was a, it was a good, yeah, you failed. Yeah. And I, I love that about Trent, too, because the look on his face is like, god damn it. Yeah, because, well, like, this guy does not like being wrong. No. At all. And he... Like, builds it up like he's going to give this grandiose, you know, one up you and just gets shot down like that. So, yeah, I mean, he's been wrong a lot of the time in this movie already. And and you can see it on his face. He's he's starting to get very tired of it. Yeah. Well, when she opened that second door, I was like, is he going to walk through or is he going to punch her in the face? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on the grounds of the church, Trent reads an excerpt from The Horror of Hobbs End, detailing the history of the black church and the evil that hides inside of it. Glancing to her left, Linda sees the dog from earlier, still being chased by children. Trent again sees nothing. They try the doors, but they're locked. The mosaic above the door depicts the archangel Michael fighting off monsters. Cars speed down the long road leading to the church. Some of the townspeople have rallied and approach with weapons, calling out for Sutter Kane to reveal himself. A fearful Linda tells Trent they have to leave, but he's way too curious about what may transpire. The leader of the townsfolk, Simon, fires his shotgun in the air and screams for Cain to give him back. The doors of the church open to reveal the man's son, but the doors keep swinging open and closed, eventually revealing Cain in place of the boy. Doberman pincers attack the group, chasing them off the property. It was a pretty vicious dog attack. Yeah. It also does nothing for the... Uh, the notoriety of uh, Dobermans. No. Just makes them seem like devil dogs. Yeah, well, I mean, it was a different time. It was. Oh, the 90s. Back at the hotel, Trent is furious and yelling at Linda about how this whole thing has been staged. Although, I don't know how you would stage out those dog attacks. No. He says he's partially right. Uh, or she says he is partially right. They were going to stage Kane's disappearance, but he never showed up for the trip. Everything that's happening is directly from his new book that nobody else but Linda and Harglow have read. The new book is about the end of the world and everything begins in Hobbs End and starts with the children. And then for some reason, Linda starts trying to make out with Trent, but he grabs his bags and leaves. See, this, this is where the conversation about insane, insane would have fit better than her trying to, for no reason at all, make out with him now. Yeah. I mean, it happens again later, but it's just, this is pointless. It does not need to be here. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Putting that conversation here would have just made the story flow so much better. Well, and the, the conversation now could have taken place with a lot more emotion. There could have been a franticness to it. It could have been yelled instead of discussed. And yeah. I feel like it would have had more impact. Agreed. And it wouldn't have felt like it was just shoehorned in there. 
Yeah, it feels very out of place. Like almost it was like a, a pickup shot where they're like, uh, let's just get some more dialogue in here. Uh, oh, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We need to get this over 90 minutes. Let's keep it in. <laughs> uh, in the lobby, Trent sees the, the painting has changed even more with now both people monstrously disfigured. He has a conversation with Mrs. Pickman, who is acting incredibly strange, constantly looking at the ground and trying to shoe something with her foot. In the background, Stiles runs past them. Trent runs after her, but she speeds off in the car. Back in the lobby of the inn, we see that Mrs. Pickman's husband is laying on the floor, naked and handcuffed to his wife's ankle. I thought that was a great reveal. Didn't need him to be naked. Didn't need, no, that was an unnecessary old man ass. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the makeup for uh, Mrs. Pickman was great. Like, she looked um, messed up. I gotta like, ask. Dead, left I, I, and, Gotta ask a follow up question. I gotta. You said unnecessary old man ass. What scenario calls for necessary old man ass? I have no answer to that question. <laughs> the, I think the more disturbing part there is I was trying to think of the movies that I've seen with old man ass where I'm like, that fit perfectly. I, I gotta be honest, I was a little worried. When I asked the question and there was silence, I was like, is he going to have an answer for me? I sure hope he, I sure hope he doesn't have an answer for it. <laughs> no, no answer. You're right. I mean, it definitely made the scene a little bit more uncomfortable. Oh, yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm contributing. I'm, I'm not, I'm not right. talking about this scene anymore. <laughs> all right. Uh, John walks to town and sits himself down at the local bar. Uh, Simon, the man from the church, sit, sits next to him and warns him of the danger. But this investigator still believes this is all just a hoax. Stiles arrives at the church where the children and dog are waiting for her. The children are now also monstrous and the dog is missing a leg. They tell her that they live with her now and that she's their mommy. Stiles runs to the church. She dismisses the sign warning her that any who dare enter this unholy site be damned forever and steps into the torchlit house of sacrilege. After some exploration, she opens a door that reveals Sutter Kane seated at a desk in front of a typewriter. He tells her that she can edit this one from the inside and how it's funny that for years he thought he was making all of this up, but it's all real. Monsters are trying to make it back to our world. A door off to the side seems to heave in and out as if breathing, containing evil on one side, but very close to breaking. Uh, what did you think of the actor who plays Sutter Kane, Jürgen Prochnow? If I'm being completely honest, I wasn't a fan. Yeah. Um, I didn't recognize him from anything when I first saw this movie, and I thought, he looks the part, but he doesn't sound it. Then I realized this man's German and has a very heavy accent, which does not come through at all in this movie. So I think he just was miscast, but like he does a great job at trying to not sound like he's German. I never would have known. Yeah, I don't know. I can't put my finger on it myself. It was just, it was just weird. He looks like a villain. He does, but I, I... His hair's a little poofy. I don't even think it's an issue with the actor. I thought I, I don't think the... I don't think the physical manifestation of the Sutter King character sat well with me. Yeah, I I, like, I like, agree with you. I like I think the 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 concept of the character works. I don't think that the physical manifestation of it works. If that makes any sense. No, oh, it does. The concept of the character is absolutely amazing. Um, but the thing is, how do you physically personify that? Uh, it's very difficult. I don't know who I would cast in that role. So I can't really take anything away from the casting director or Carpenter, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I, don't, like even, I, don't, actor, even, but... I don't even know if I would have had an actor for it. What would you have done then? Because the character demands screen time. I think I would need more time to think about it, but even if I'm just looking at this scene in and of itself, I might have no physical presence and like maybe 
the typewriter is typing answers to her by itself, like sentiently, almost like it's an essence rather than a than a being. I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to think about it a little bit more. Yeah. I definitely feel like there would have to be some sort of physical representation. But again, even then, like you having to think about it being a presence and be thinking about an actual actor, we would both have to focus on that for a while because I don't think it's an easy solution. Yeah. Um, Kane refers to his work as the new Bible. He grabs Linda by her hair and holds her face over his new manuscript. Flashes of blood, tentacles, the past and the future fill the screen. Tears of blood run from her eyes as she takes Cain into her arms, embracing not only the author, but the monstrous creature that is now emerging from his back. That scene always felt weird for me. Um, I don't fully get it. I just think it's, again, like I said before, this is just clunky. She returns to the inn, screaming at Trent that, he's lo- that she's losing herself. She's read the book, and he can't let it get out. John runs to the lobby, looking for Pikmin. He grabs a phone and glances at the painting that now depicts two twisted Lovecraftian creatures on the grass, the black church in the distance. He hears screams from down the hall and investigates. The old woman is now fully transformed into a monster and is hacking away at her husband with an axe. Trent runs upstairs to get Linda, and she too has turned. Trent jumps into the car and speeds into town. He stops when he sees the kids in the road singing Ring Around the Rosy with, and dancing around Linda. He runs into the bar where he encounters Simon. The man is also turning into a monster. He puts a barrel of a shotgun under his chin and Trent tries to stop him, but Simon just says, he wrote me this way, and pulls the trigger. I'm going to say something that I think you're not going to like. Go for it. I wasn't a fan of the Miss Pickman practicals when she was chopping up her husband. No, it was pretty rough. It. Oh, okay, so... You agree. All right. Yeah, no, it's a great idea. And it's like, if they, I, I don't understand why they did it. Like, I know they described it earlier in the movie and that they were trying to realize that description with practical effects. But if those effects aren't there, change the description at the beginning. Like, yeah, write the script so that it works. I, I think this was one of those situations where maybe they were ambitious beyond their capabilities when it came to these practicals. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I mean, it feels like they were able to do so much better, um, even in the thing, how much earlier, uh, but maybe they were just kind of trying to stay a little more subdued. I'm not sure. Maybe it was all the moving parts with this one. I'm not sure. It was too big. That is, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry. Sorry. No, no. Uh, it's like what, what really made the special effects in the thing work so well is that they were all just really small bits like the weird little like wispy tentacles just like whipping all over the place much easier to do than giant snake arms like it just doesn't look right yeah yeah Yeah. you know what is right i feel like that's a trick question no what's right listening to the knights and nerds podcast let's hear an ad from our friend tim Knights and Nerds is not just an actual play D&D podcast with an original campaign being played by a group of friends who tolerate each other. It's also a podcast where I, the Dungeon Master, talk about how I'm adapting to the choices the players make, as well as revealing to you, the audience, the complex story and deadly twists that I have in store for my players. Find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or at knightsandnerds.com. And we're back. This is where things get even weirder. Um, There's just a few different things that happen in the next scene that just feel way too out of place. Okay. Because Trent runs out of the bar and into the car, but Linda's also inside, and she grabs the keys from him and eats them. He knocks her out, hot wires the car, and speeds away from the mob of Twisted Townsfolk who are slowly approaching. Linda tells Trent then that Kane is writing her to do things, and then she tries to jump him. The investigator slams on the brakes and gets out of the car, and a deformed Linda crawls out after him, which I would say the worst effects of the movie. 
They're pretty bad. It's terrible. Absolutely terrible. Unforgivable, even. Trent wow. jumps back in the car and speeds off. The screen flashes and he's back in Hobbs End in front of the mob. He turns around and floors it. Another flash and he's again in Hobbs End. Again, he drives off and gets the same result, but this time he drives through the crowd and ends up crashing into a lamppost. He wakes in a confessional booth, Kane in the booth next to him. The two debate over what is and isn't true, the power of belief. The author insists that Trent must read the new book. He needs new readers, new believers. Trent is then shown the same visions at which Linda bore witness. The new book, In the Mouth of Madness, has been completed, and Kane needs Trent to deliver the manuscript. He wrote this to be so, just like the town, just like Trent. This is all Kane's creation, but Trent refuses to believe it. That is until his certainty begins to waver. Uh, awesome scene. Uh, look on Trent's face as he starts to wonder if he actually exists. It was very well done. Um, again, probably weaker acting from Prochnow, but... Uh, I think it's probably one of the more powerful scenes in the movie. Thoughts? No. No thoughts. Very good. Kane then rips at his face, which peels away, just sheets of paper torn apart to reveal a void. And I apologize, there's no way for me to write these notes and have them make any sense, but I tried. Okay. Trent approaches the blackness and gazes inside, all while Linda narrates his actions from Kane's newest tome. Her words of Trent's vision depict horrible twisted creatures rushing toward the light from the void that John's peering into. The man turns and flees, running down an ever-lengthening hallway, the abominations in pursuit. Just as they reach him, he falls to the ground screaming, but as his body hits the floor, he awakens on a dirt road. He pulls himself up off the ground. It's now midday, and he's made it out of Hobbs End. The boy on the bike reappears and checks in on John. He just wants to find the nearest highway. He catches a ride from a passing long hauler and sets up camp at a motel for the night. The next day, Trent's told that a package has arrived for him. It's the manuscript. He rips up the pages and burns them in the sink of his room, then gets on a bus headed for home. Well, I mean, first he's completely unnecessarily aggressive and mean to the guy who just tried to give him the package. I don't think it's unnecessarily me, though. I mean, he's been through shit. He has been, but it's, it's not that he, guy's he's not, fault. He's not <laughs> thinking rationally. You, you can't hold him to that. I mean, if the situations were reversed, he'd get a terrible, terrible review on his hotel score. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that place looked like trash anyway. It would always get a horrible review. Yeah, if it's going to look that bad, I mean, you've got to hold on to whatever stars you got left. Well, think about fire standards. He burnt that entire manuscript in the sink in the bathroom. Yeah, you'd think a fire alarm would have gone off or something. Right? <laughs> Screw that place. Yeah, you would have been safer off back at the church. <laughs> uh, he has nightmares of Kane, and we see how Kane's influence is driving Trent insane. Um, and that would be the, uh, the bus scene, which I love. I did like that scene. Um, the whole, uh, I did I ever how... tell you my favorite color was blue? Yes. I was, I forgot the wording, but I was going to say, yeah, when he, he mentions blue and then Trent wakes up and everything has like a blue tint to it. Yeah. And the scream that emits from his mouth is perfect. Like you can tell that is Trent just breaking psychologically yeah it was a nice subtle way too to show that it wasn't just a dream right yeah. like yeah. that kane had some manipulation outside of it exactly uh he passes the same posters from the beginning of the film but this time rips one further and reveals a poster of himself underneath um and honestly now we're really just getting random scenes showing trent losing his grip on reality he has a meeting with Harglow to describe what happened to himself and Linda during the investigation. The agent says that's quite a story, but questions whether Trent actually believes it. John states that he isn't crazy, but Harglow reminds him that Kane's work has different effects on readers, and he has no idea who this Linda person is. He sent John on his own to find Kane. John's explanation is that Kane simply wrote out of the story. He believes everything he said is real, and that's why he destroyed the manuscript. 
A confused Harglow says he knows that's not true because Trent already delivered the manuscript to him months ago. The book's already been published and has been in stores for weeks, and the movie comes out next month. Trent stumbles out of the office in disbelief. Now, we're not told this, but it's obviously some time later from his meeting with Harglow. Uh, outside, we see lineups of people waiting to get their copy of the new Sutter Kane novel, which has John Trent adorning its cover. News on the radio reports violence is filling the streets all over the world and describes it as an epidemic of paranoid schizophrenia. A man exits a bookstore, his face buried in the new Kane novel. He's stopped by a dirty and disheveled Trent. And again, like, how much time has passed here? It seems like a while. So is this a, asked, another book after the, like... No, it's, it's, the timeline is messed up at this point because this is in the mouth of madness. I'm messed up right now. <laughs> But also notice how Trent is now dressed exactly the same as the agent from the beginning. Trench coat and all. I guess, but I mean, like... It's weird. It's Harlow very weird. said that the book came out months ago, and then the movie's just about to come out. Yeah, it came out weeks ago. The movie comes out next month. But people are but buying the, the book, book now because it just came out, and it's... Ah! Yeah. Well, John asks the man if he's enjoying the new book, to which the man says he loves it. Trent approves and remove it, removes an axe from under his jacket, telling him that this shouldn't come as a surprise then. He raises the axe up over his head and heaves it down, killing the man. The screams of onlookers fill the street. Now we cut back to the asylum, where John's finishing uh, recounting his story to Wren. And every time I watch this movie, I forget that this has all been him relaying a story to I the didn't. doctor. I know you didn't. Uh, the doctor leaves the cell, stunned by the story he just heard. He tries to shake it off and tells Saperstein that Trent was useless and believes that Sutter Kane is causing the world to fall apart. Saperstein asks the doctor if he actually reads Sutter Kane. Uh, Ren doesn't answer and simply walks off. Trent is laying on his mattress when the power goes out. Screams echo down the hallway, and it sounds as if people are being torn apart. Then a few seconds of terrifying silence. Trent's door begins to shake violently before the locks are ripped off and the door is left ajar. He walks out of his cell and down the destroyed hallway, through the lobby, and out the front door. We get another radio report, this time about people mutating, their bodies deforming. John walks down the city street and stops at a theater. The poster in the window is for In the Mouth of Madness. He enters the empty theater, gets himself some popcorn, and takes a seat. On the screen, we see Trent's arrival to the institution from the beginning of the film. All Trent can do is sit back and stare in awe of what is unfolding before his eyes. That is, until he starts laughing maniacally louder and louder and roll credits. I was okay with the ending for this. Uh, I don't know how else they could really do it. Uh, I felt it kind of wrap everything up nicely. Uh, what's your stance? I completely lost sight of what the hell was going on okay i thought uh, i, I at, at thought i was following and then right at the end they did all these different time jumps and it just got so jumbled at the end that i lost sight of any theories of what actually happened and i just kind of gave up not really i just uh, i took it as sutter kane as constantly fucking with john trent but like are we supposed to believe that john trent is a fictional character that sutter kane wrote in is this taking place at any point was linda a a part of sutter kane's plan from the start because harlow didn't know who she was at what point did she switch sides if she like it just i i thought we would get a little bit more closure on at least some of the stuff. We did. We completely did. It goes back to what Linda was saying about uh, sane and insane switching places and how Sutter Kane is actually trans. But he's, he's become otherworldly. He is controlling reality with his typewriter, with his pen. He is writing reality. And he's been messing with John Trent since... He started looking for him time and time again. He's well, just but that doesn't explain them. if John Trent is a character that he 
created in his writing or not? Uh, I don't think he was created by Kane, no. But as Kane grew in power, his ability to manipulate reality was just him fucking with John. And was Linda created by Kane then? Because no, but he wrote her out. He wrote her out. So, so the idea is that she really did exist. Mm -hmm. But his power grew to the point that he could just write her out of existence. He's making reality. He's allowing the old ones into the world to take over through the physical human body. Yeah, yes, he's he's he's, be, he's become God at this point. This is where I lost sight of what the heck was going on. Oh really? I loved it. It is it could it could be clearer. I will give you that. It could I, be a I, lot clearer. I don't even necessarily need an explanation to all of those questions I just asked. Mm -hmm. I don't need to know if John Trent is uh, uh, like a creation of Sutter's my like Sutter's like writing, or if Linda mm -hmm. is, or if at some point Linda did turn. I would have just liked a little bit more clarity on, like, okay, yes, Sutter Kane is literally rewriting the fabric of existence. Yeah. Then I can this, let go. We are of, seeing the end of the world right now. Then I can let go of all of the other questions, right? Yep. If not that, give me some of the answers to the other stuff. But it's like you could e you could have either explained all of the mysteries, or you could have given us like a coverall by saying, or at least in some way more clearly indicating that he is rewriting the fabric of reality. And I just feel like they didn't really do either. Um, okay. I feel um, like I would need like a timeline graph to show like, this is where this splits in the timeline. This is where this splits in the timeline. And then literally just say, okay, from the moment that John Trent entered Hobbes End, this is when Kane started to rewrite everything moving forward. Um, but it, right now, I'm still wondering, like, how early did he start rewriting things, right? Well, I think it's, uh, it's a personal stance. Uh, I think he started messing with Trent when Trent started reading his books. I See, feel like that that was the uh, the wall that was broken down that allowed Sutter Kane to start controlling him or writing him as a fictitious character as opposed to an actual human being. Uh, I, I really enjoy this. I feel like it's incredibly cohesive and it does, it warrants a rewatch. Um, but I, I love the story. I think that to me anyway, the ending was clear. Maybe it's just a misinterpretation on my end, but I, I, I pieced it together in a way where it, it just seems perfect. It, it's a perfect end to the story. Yeah. Now it's also, I have to say, having or being such a big John Carpenter fan, um, while this is unofficial, this is considered to be the third movie of John Carpenter's uh, Apocalypse trilogy. Uh, his stories that start off with a conflict that eventually leads to the end of the world. Um, the first movie being The Thing, uh, the second being Prince of Darkness, and In the Mouth of Madness being the third. Uh, now, I'd say they're only a trilogy in theme, definitely not story, but you can see the story grow and arc and end with these three movies. Um, there is one little funny bit I do want to add on. Did you watch all of the credits? No. Uh, well, there's your standard uh, animal bit. Like uh, Animal action was monitored by the American Humane Association with onset supervision by the Toronto Humane Society. No animal was harmed in the making of this film. And immediately after that, it says uh, human interaction was monitored by the Interplanetary Psychiatric Association. The body count was high. The casualties are heavy. Oh, I didn't get that. It's just a fun joke that doesn't fit with this movie, but I got a good laugh out of it. Fair enough. I... How do you uh, how do you think the movie did overall? If I had to guess, I'd say that it made a profit. No. Oh. Yeah. Uh, budget of eight million. Uh, gross of uh, eight point nine million. And honestly, I'm not surprised. Like there is not a mass appeal for this kind of movie. 
I don't even know if I would like to have seen it in theaters. I was very happy watching this on VHS for the first time. It just kind of fits that. It doesn't really fit like watching it in a theater, like in a room with like a hundred other people. It, just, it, it doesn't work. It's not. It's not a group movie. I don't think. No, it doesn't sound like there would have been a hundred other people in the theater with you. So. Yeah, really though, right? <laughs> so you wouldn't have had to worry about that. But it it does have like a solid fan base, like a decent appreciation. Uh, IMDb, it's at seven point two out of ten. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes critics uh, gave it 58%, which I think is a little low, but the audience score is sitting at 73%. Um, I, I don't think it's a middle of the road movie. Uh, I, I would definitely say like seven, eight. Uh, it's really entertaining. It's thought provoking, if anything, and for the most part, pretty competent. But if we're going to talk about how competent the film is, do you want to get into the awards? I love the awards. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I guess it's me with the worst performance. Unless, and, uh, unless you want to change it up. That's the usual I, order. I feel like we're probably going to have the same. I, I picked Julie Carmen as Linda Stiles. I did as well. Rough, man. Rough from beginning to end. Yeah, there was a big part of it where I thought it was perhaps the chemistry between the two that just wasn't working. But then when I went back and looked at scenes that she was not in with Sam Neill, uh, when she was by herself, when she was with Sutter Kane, mm-hmm. it also didn't work for me. Um, I wish I could say why. I just... It's weird, right? Like, it it's didn't fit. line I, delivery. Um, physical presence. Uh, emotion. Like, none of it seemed... Right. It was all just slightly off. I think she might have been miscast in this. Yeah. Uh, I would 100% say she was miscast. Yeah, I think she was punching up above her weight class with this one. Yeah, but the thing is, like, Carpenter's normally good for spotting that, so... Was it intentional? And if so, what was the point? Because I don't feel it would have hit if she was supposed to feel that off from the very beginning. But I don't know. The only way that I could see it being intentional is if you do explain that Sutter Kane had created her. Like, not that he had wiped her out of existence after the fact, but that he had completely created her. And then you could almost justify a more kind of robotic, fish out of water performance because she's not supposed to really be in this plane of existence. Um, Which is a very interesting thought. But at the same time, if Sutter Kane is supposed to be such a great author, you think that would be seamless. Well, I mean, he's a great author, but if prior to now his writing didn't come out into the real world, you could see how him fabricating like a human being into existence might not go as smoothly right away, right? Yeah, um, entirely plausible. Wow. Okay. I say entirely plausible. You sound like a crazy man, but... <laughs> <laughs> in the sense of this movie, yeah, I think that's entirely possible. But that's not what we got, or if that was the intention, they didn't explain it very well. And as a result, whether it is Julie Carmen's fault or not, it comes off as a bad performance. And yes, I, for, I've always thought that. For all we know, it's not her fault. But this is where maybe a little bit more explanation, not like a, like like you don't have to, you know, wrap everything up in a pretty little package. You don't have to spoon feed all of the information, but just a little bit more uh, direction might have saved her performance or at least created that justification on why she felt so like unearthly. Yeah. Um, A movie like this where it begs your interpretation, I think there's a danger of, thinking about it too much and i think that yeah if you streamlined this character if that's what the character is kind of give us a few more hints that that's what this character is and then maybe it wouldn't end up as worse performance for me but i agree like it's just something's wrong here altogether yeah Yeah. what about uh best performance i had to go with sam neill as sam trent or as john trent Um, yeah me too like he 
any of the issues I had with him in this movie are like what we talked about earlier with like the getting hit by the chip scene. They're mm-hmm. weird juxtapositions to what they're actually doing with the character. But if you look at them in and of themselves in a vacuum, his performance is fantastic. Even yeah. though that scene with the chips and the horn that he honks in her face for no reason at all doesn't make sense for the character, he acts it very well. Oh, yeah. You could easily see this as like a scene from a completely different movie and be fine with it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think that even though there was some lack of direction on on what type of a character he is... He played multiple roles very well for a person who wasn't actually playing multiple roles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was great. Um, I I love Sam Neill. Uh, I love the character of John Trent. I really do. Um, I would like to make one other point, though. It felt like there was very little to pick from for these awards for cast. Because it really yeah. doesn't feel like anybody beyond these two and maybe Sutter Kane got enough screen time. Uh, Yeah. It's a, it's a two person movie for sure. That's like, I can't remember feeling that way about a movie we've talked about before where so many of the secondary characters were just, just window dressing for the most part, for lack of a better Mm -hmm. term. And Um, there are a lot of them too. Yeah. Like there's a, like you, 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 there's a big cast, but like none of them matter except for these two. And maybe you could say 2.5 with Sutter Kane is mm-hmm. kind of partially at the end. So, you know, kind of maybe that's partially why Julie got the <laughs> worst actor award too, right? So, yeah, uh, it, entirely possible. I, I never really thought about it until you brought that up. But yeah, like there's some heavy hitters in this too, like David Warner and uh, uh, Charlton Heston. Um, but they're really inconsequential. Yeah, like you you look back at it and like Charleston Charlton Heston's in like two scenes. Yep. Like <laughs> like and that might be the most screen time that somebody other than those three get. <laughs> like yeah. Dr. Wren is only in a couple scenes. John yep. Glover is only in a couple scenes. Like Miss Pickman is essentially a couple of scenes. <laughs> two, maybe three. Yeah, like it was slim pickings. <laughs> I'm actually kind of liking the movie more for that now that I think about it. I guess, but I mean, if you want to look at it that way, if you if the movie rests on essentially two people's shoulders, and one of them is disappointing, that you don't leave yourself a lot of room for error. Well, I mean, Sam Neill doesn't win best performance for me by process of elimination of one other person. Like he's just great. He is, but I'm I'm just saying from a movie standpoint in yeah. and of itself. That's a lot of weight to put on two roles. And if you yeah. drop the ball on either of them, your movie takes We're a much at... bigger hit, right? So. We're looking at you, Julie Kern. <laughs> uh, what did you have for most memorable or favorite line? <clears throat> um, I have a favorite line, but uh, I kind of shrugged it off because I have a more, like, a line that stuck with me. I just want to say my favorite line is Trent. Uh in the asylum at the end saying every species can smell its own extinction. The last ones left won't have a pretty time with it in 10 years, maybe less. The human race will just be a bedtime story for their children, a myth and nothing more. I like that line a lot, but the one that really sticks with me and has to win it for me is just the line from Sutter Kane that says, I think therefore you are. It's a good one. It's a good play on a classic line and yep. definitely portrays what they had. Um, it, it's the plot of the movie, basically. Yeah, yeah. In one sentence, I presumably. Think, therefore, you are. Yeah, presumably. Uh, there's no presumption there. We just don't know when or how much he thought about them. So, yeah, I thought of you drunk, and this jumbled mess occurred. I don't know, man. Like, I got a lot of questions. I don't know. You're having a lot of problems with this. I don't understand. I, I, yeah, I guess I would need somebody to explain it to me. Um, uh, what about you? What's your uh, memorable or favorite line? Uh, you actually talked about it fairly extensively. Um, it was when a reality is just what we tell each other it is. Sane mm-hmm. and insane could easily switch places if the insane were to become the majority. 
Um, I absolutely loved the line. I just didn't like when it took place in the movie. I, you know, kind of tip yeah, my hat on it. I think it would have been done more impactfully as like an emotional response in the hotel room as they're kind of panicking and, and, you know, just kind of stricken with desperation after the first encounter at the church. But mm -hmm. I can't deny the words themselves. They're very well done. It's very impactful. And it's just perhaps my favorite bit of writing in this movie. It's great. It's really, really good. Yep. Memorable scene. I went with when Simon kills himself in the bar. Um, really? Yeah. And I think, I think the, the thing that puts it over the top, because I was, I was actually really debating the, the first scene when uh, Julie Carmen is, or I guess Linda is, driving and she sees the bicyclist changing ages mm -hmm. but i think that the scene with simon killing himself is just kind of put over the top by him saying like i can't help it he wrote me this way mm -hmm. in and of itself the line wasn't enough to win my most memorable line but it really complemented this like the, the amount of control that sutter kane had at that moment Right? Like, there is mm -hmm. no, like, I don't control my fate. There is nothing beyond this. I have to do what was written. It's a powerful scene. Yeah. No, it's a great scene. It's pretty intense. I, I get exactly what you're saying and why you picked it. Um, for me, it's again showing uh, the power of Sutter Kane. And that would be Did I ever tell you my favorite color is blue? Um, that scene on the bus. Because John, John has been fighting the acceptance that everything is being written, that he isn't in control of his own destiny, that Sutter Kane is doing whatever he wants to reality. And to an extent, John is just another victim of Sutter Kane. So him fighting that notion for the entire film up until the point where he wakes up and everything is tinted blue and he just snaps. Like, that is where his downfall begins, at that one scene. And the look on his face and the sound that's coming out of his throat don't fully match up and are incredibly jarring when paired together. I think it was perfect. I love it. It, it stands out for me in memory since I first saw this in 95. It's a great scene, honestly. I'd put it top three for myself, personally. Yeah. Um, I was... I was more kind of swayed by the potential of like the bike scene as well as obviously the one that I did pick, but it was one of the ones I considered um, maybe just based on the time it took place in the movie, the control mm -hmm. we had already seen from Sutter Kane kind of took away a little bit of the impact of that. I mean, we watched Sutter Kane force a guy to kill himself, right? If the scenes happened in reverse, maybe the, the blue would have kind of, tipped over the scales but i i don't know it was like kind of the the first display of power that stood out to me more mm -hmm. yeah fair enough so those are our thoughts for the awards um obviously before we get to recommendations i'll remind everybody else we would love to hear your thoughts on it share your awards any snippets or thoughts comments anything you have on this movie uh, we would love to read them we would love to hear what you guys think obviously this is a movie that does elicit a lot more, you know, self uh, thought and self uh, um, perception of what's taking place. You can hit us up on Twitter, YouTube. Um, you know what? You guys know all the links already. I've mentioned them a million times. Um, I'm, I'm going to cut you off for one second here because there is something else I do want to say. Um, with this movie, because we, I, I don't know if you wanted to recommend it or not, but I, I literally I, said before we get to recommendations <laughs> whatever okay <laughs> i i i've had a lot of thought about this film and i think the one word i could use to sum it up is terrifying um it, i've always found it scary uh, not what was shown on screen but the idea that i'm losing my grip on what's real and that somebody's controlling my actions um a loss of identity, a loss of conviction. It's all terrifying. Uh, 
this movie captured it incredibly well. And I think that's why I love John Carpenter's movies. Cause we see these themes a lot. Um, Nada and they live, um, is being deceived until he puts on the glasses. Um, Michael Myers is a faceless threat. Uh, the thing shows us that we can't trust people we know. Um, and the idea that we can't trust others is one thing, but the notion that we can't trust ourselves is in and of itself, absolutely terrifying. And I think, think based off that idea alone and how well it's conveyed in the movie this is 100 percent a recommendation i'm sorry to cut you off i just had to get that out there it's been like eating at me since we started recording i I mean we were gonna jump right into that um (laughs) like 10 seconds later um i already did (laughs) but that's perfectly fine um well one thing first of all ben if you know, if that scares you, the idea of losing control because somebody is controlling your destiny, no need to worry about it because they would have written in that you were worried about it. Um, as for a recommendation, I have to say, I don't like this movie. I didn't like this movie. I don't like this movie. I don't want to watch it again. I do, however, recommend it. Yeah. Simply, Why is that? Simply because... There is no hiding the fact that this movie is created in a way that is meant to to have personal interpretation, perception of the outcome, and there is just as strong of a possibility that somebody will watch this movie and based on their own ideas of what took place, will love it as they will hate it. And I don't think anybody should rob themselves of the potential of loving this movie. I myself did not go that route. But I think that anybody who doesn't give themselves the chance to make that decision themselves shouldn't take it from the opinion of somebody else. They should get it themselves. Yep. Yep. That sums it up. Uh, It's definitely not a movie for everybody. Uh, It is a movie for me it is one of my all-time favorites uh i feel bad that you didn't like it um but again i guess you know it it, this is not a sandro film no i mean i can see the merit but it just wasn't for me so um and again like i said i can't stress it enough as much as i didn't like it i also think people should watch it agreed all right that being said ben yeah We have a fan pick for next week, do we not? Yes, we do. All right, buddy. What are we watching next week? Oh, shit. I wasn't prepared for that. I don't have the date down or anything. But (laughs) (laughs) I know the movie. So uh, based off of our poll on Twitter, the uh, the winner for the uh, listener pick for the next episode is The Wizard. From 1989. 1989's The Wizard. It's a California, please. That's two hundred and twenty-six dollars. Well, we only have twenty-seven dollars and thirty cents. What does that get us? Nowhere. Corey's taking his brother Jimmy on a ride. These two boys already traveled more than eighty miles across the state. We've hired someone to find him. What's his problem? He's just shy. But Jimmy's got a secret. You got fifty thousand on Double Dragon? that could make this the ride of their lives. Look at him. He's a wizard. He's headed for the video championship. (laughs) This guy? What is that? Power glove. Yeah, well, uh, just keep your power gloves up for all right. With a touch of romance. I am not kissing a boy. And a ton of trouble. Got you. We're too late. Put me down! Sorry about that. They'll get there any way they can. Jimmy! Here we come! It's Jimmy! It's Jimmy! Come here! Now what do you think you're doing to him? All his life, you've been telling him to do what you want him to do. How about once you ask him what he wants to do, huh? Now, video Armageddon. It's going to take a lot of guts. You can do it! 
a little magic. You're the best! And the wizard, Fred Savage. The wizard. All right, so get watching that one, and until next week, have a good one, guys. All the best, guys. 